according to the Hindu, one of the national newspapers there, the most daily deaths in the world from COVID are happening in India now. And in fact, one in three deaths from COVID worldwide are happening in India. One in three new infections of COVID worldwide are happening in India. And obviously, you know, irrespective of what you call the variant, it's the it's the problem that remains for India, as, as you've um, as you've suggested. What, what is India winning or losing the battle against Corona? At the moment, I don't think it's winning. Although numbers in the cities are declining, they're really going up in the villages. And in fact, the news channels in India are all talking about a COVID phase three. You know, out of a population of about 1.4 billion people, only less than 15% have been vaccinated and less than 4% doesn't have been double vaccinated. So things are not looking good. And the Indian prime minister is coming in for a lot of backlash over this because January 2021, he was already too early trumpeting the success of an Indian fight back against COVID. But really, India had failed to stockpile and hadn't done proper planning. And straight after that, there were state elections and a whole series of religious festivals that we've spoken of, Sikh, Hindu, Muslim, which did not observe hardly any protocols. And people were hugging, they were jumping into rivers together, bathing. It was really a COVID breeding ground. And at one stage, there were even quack remedies being touted by somebody who was known to the government. And in fact, by March, phase three vaccine trials were supposed to have happened, but they haven't. They haven't. And so now India's really having to play catch up. It's surprising given that India makes its own vaccines. This is a country that is self-sufficient in that respect, isn't it? It's surprising that there's been such a little take-up. Is that the the fault of the government or is something not feeding through to the population? I think it's the fact that the availability wasn't there, that, you know, the supplies were not there. India does make its own version of the AstraZeneca, in fact. It's called Covishield there. And that is being rolled out now, but very, very late, you know. And some supplies have been ordered from Russia, the Sputnik vaccine. But the thing is that India is very strict about data from the testing has to have been locally done in India. The the vaccines need to have been tested in India, especially the foreign ones. So, for instance, the Pfizer that's widely in use elsewhere India dispatched its foreign minister to the US, but it won't allow the Pfizer to be used right now until it's had local trials. So that probably won't get underway till about July. There is an Indian vaccine that's being used, and that's said to be quite effective against the variants. But again, it needs to be rolled out and tested too. So it's all in the planning and the organization where India's fallen down here. So I I don't think it's going to be until mid-July at the very earliest that we're going to see any kind of stabilization at all. And as I said, the numbers are declining a bit in the cities, but they're soaring in rural areas. And to talk about this, I turn to Hasaran Pandey. She was the Southeast Asia Regional Information Officer with the World Health Organization, and she's now a media health consultant. And she's got direct experience. She lives in New Delhi, but she's got another home in the rural areas in the state of Himachal Pradesh. And she told me what's been going on. In the cities, the number of COVID cases and deaths has definitely come down as unlocking has also begun. I think the bigger worry now is what's happening in the villages, both in the plains and in the hills. Large numbers of people are now getting infected in the second wave. Very often it's tourists who are coming up to hill stations or people returning home to villages who are bringing in the infection. The locals who have thus far not been exposed do not know about taking precautions and they get infected. In Himachal, where my holiday home is. The village weaver, for example, got infected and being diabetic also died. Unfortunately, at his funeral, many people gathered and there were no COVID protocols, which meant many more people and families got infected. A whole village 
got infected and has been now put down under lockdown. The worry is in states where health facilities are not adequate to meet with the challenges of COVID, there are going to be severe problems as the numbers are growing. And the issue is, how will the states deal with this? That's Harsha and Pandey of the WHO there. And I suppose that question that she asked at the end of that puts it into perspective that this is beyond, I would have thought, the national government in Delhi's um, ability to, to contain, that it is down to those individual regions, isn't it, to to make sure that people observe the COVID protocols, etc. But nobody does, Dot, and India is not a joined up country. The states and the central government are often feuding. And there's no way of making sure that these hundreds of thousands who, for instance, observed the Hindu Kumela festival, observed any kind of protocols. You know, you either ban those festivals, but people are still going to disobey. And, and the national government has no way of compelling the regions? Not effectively. I mean, I would say that they can impose rules and regulations, so it has to be implemented. But there are so many different layers, a legacy of, of the British perhaps, but India is so bureaucratized and there's so much scope for corruption and there's such a lack of education at ground level that there are too many holes in between for um, things to fall through. Well, we'll wait and see. Um, no doubt next time we speak also we'll have an update on to, uh the latest with regards to India and COVID. There's a story about censorship in India that involves a new technology. What's that about? Well, the Facebook-owned WhatsApp, I should say at the outset, India is its biggest market, 400 million customers there out of a customer base of over 2 billion worldwide. The Indian censorship is coming into play here, and WhatsApp has sued the Indian government just last week to block new regulations which India is bringing in. India wants to force WhatsApp to allow its messages to be read and not be what we call encrypted and recorded in a traceable database. The new law that India is bringing in requires companies to keep a footprint of every single message sent on WhatsApp. And big tech and Twitter has clashed before with Prime Minister Modi. It's sort of part of a wider problem. In fact, Indian police raided Twitter offices and Twitter was forced to take down certain tweets that were critical of the Indian government. Now, India says that encryption endangers its national security and it's important that the police and the government needs to have social media access. The new regulations make tech giants remove what India calls unlawful content and give the government the ability to trace sources of what it calls unlawful messages. And WhatsApp says that the new laws are unconstitutional and undermines the right to privacy. And they accuse the Indian government of undergoing mass surveillance. It does seem from what you're saying that the last battle that social or the new technology had with the Indian government, that the Indian government won that, at least against Twitter. Are they likely to win this one? WhatsApp is standing squarely, you know, and it takes a lot to take on the labyrinthine Dickensian Indian legal system. So, but WhatsApp has got a lot to lose with 400 million customers over there. So, it's going to be interesting how this plays out. Facebook and WhatsApp is very, very powerful in its own right. And Modi himself, you know, ironically depends on social media. And there are Indian variations of social media, but he really relies on social media. And it's one of the reasons he's been winning elections. So it'll be interesting to see, because India needs social media, but it also seems to want to control it. It's part of a wider crackdown across the country. And people do compare Prime Minister Modi to President Trump, don't they? And to, we know how his ban has been extended, I think, for two years now on Twitter. Um, phew, it'd be wise maybe to keep an eye on developments in that side, if he, he believes in that comparison anyway. 
Yes, I agree with you because, and in fact, uh, Trump and Modi are very fond of bear hugging each other, and they both have an appetite for social approval. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Meanwhile, Amazon Prime um, is doing good business in India. I'm surprised at that, actually, because you'd have thought that there was the equivalent of Amazon, uh, not just in terms of groceries and and shopping in India, but in terms of the the um, online platform that it offers for streaming movies and so on. You'd have thought so, Dotton, but there's an Amazon Prime India, you see, and that's so popular that one of the new shows in its second season, in fact, has just come out, Family Man, is among the top top three Indian series watched on Amazon Prime globally. And in fact, it's also popular amongst non-Indians. One in five viewers of this series is not Asian, and it's been translated into Japanese and Italian and a couple of other languages already. This is Family Man I'm talking about. And but you have the it, cartoon, yeah? No, no, not, not, not the cartoon. Oh, right. It's, oh, so, OK. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cop series. It's a spy thriller. And it's a real cult phenomenon, actually. But it's a spy with a difference. It's not your Daniel Craig, James Bond or Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt, you know, with their death-defying stunts. This is a spy with a home life and he has trouble with the wife. So you see him doing all these death-defying stunts and fighting fighting the baddies, but you also see him, you know, uh, on the verge of marriage collapse. And this is all down to a couple of Indians from California who were actually software engineers. Well, they've turned to filmmaking, and they have taken traditional genres, like horror, for instance, and injected it with humour. So they're trying to take genres and upend them a little bit. So with the spy thriller genre, they're giving the characters a 3D perspective. And this series is really gritty and realistic. And that's why the streaming giants are really winning out and becoming so popular, because they're upending the sort of traditional format of what Indians can normally watch. Family Man has just been released. It did get put back because another Amazon Prime series offended certain members of the government. But in this one that's just come out, the creators, Raj and DK, actually did talk to me. And I asked them why they switched from software engineering consulting to filmmaking. The right side of the brain wasn't working, wasn't being put to work at all. So we were programming and we were, you know, doing IT stuff and uh, there wasn't enough satisfaction in the job. We always somehow knew that we were filmmakers at heart. The monotony kind of was killing me and that we really wanted to switch to making movies. I think we'd like to take on a certain genre because genre films are a great vehicles or carriers to say something more than what it's supposed to do. A simple genre film is just to get you that excitement of either fear or comedy or you know action or a thrill or whatever. But we find that vehicle fascinating to put in a lot more in it. So we're liking this idea, even though it wasn't by design. Later on, we are seeing what we're trying to do each time, like take a spy thriller, give it a twist to it. After shooting in London for season two, for The Family Man, I took a holiday, a quick holiday in Barcelona. As soon as we landed in Barcelona, I saw in the main paper, it was there, Family Man, I didn't even know what this said, and it was like a big article and I had to take a picture to get it translated from a friend. But it was awesome. It kind of reiterated our belief that the more authentic you do, the more local you go, the more global it gets. Yeah, the creators of Family Man there. I wonder how this streaming, and not just particularly Family Man, but of all movies, have affected Bollywood, Rani, and not just the streaming of uh, movies, because there is a lot of Indian films available on even Amazon Prime in the UK, but also the pandemic. How has that affected Bollywood? Well, it did affect filmmaking in Bollywood, and everything got suspended, even even the stuff that was made for the for the streamers. And my filmmaking friends in India have told me that they now have to be really strict about protocols and how people are fed and and how they're organized. But it's ramping up again. I think what it did do was 
the the pandemic meant that people were taking more fare in you know they were they were watching more even even if the production had sort of slowed down and i actually spoke to the lead actor of family man who's a theater man at heart he was trained in in india's finest uh, school of drama and i asked him what freedoms the streaming giants gave filmmakers and actors and creatives now. And over in India, they call the streaming giants OTTs, over the top. OTT has given us a chance, or the filmmakers a chance, to be completely unconventional and think out of box when it comes to storytelling or, or creating characters, which was not the case earlier because cinema in India, it, it follows a very conventional pattern of having a hero, a heroine. They talk about OTT, OTT, and it's such a simple sort of thing that stands for over the top, which kind of makes sense over the top of the conventional broadcasters. And I asked Manoj also how they were managing the Indian censor board. And the writers have told the story. They put the viewpoint of each and every character, which might have seen a lot more objection in a, in a very sensitive society like ours, but tremendous welcome by the audience. Or if I talk about some other series, so many scenes, which otherwise gets cut, they were being shown and people got used to it. Now it doesn't matter. They just look at the age and above, say 18 years and above, and they have become the censor board for their children. They are monitoring their children, what they are watching, they are not watching. So the responsibility of the censor board has gone from the board to the parents. Rania, I wonder which is the biggest threat, though, to, to this vast industry called Bollywood, whether it is the Indian censors or it is the OTT streaming services in terms of bums on seats, if you like. Will people go back to the cinemas, do you think, after the pandemic? I think they will, because you're talking about, you know, in India, the, the mass of the population is not the elite, shall we say. And they adore cinema. They adore their heroes, Shah Rukh Khan and people like that. So I think cinemas will always... Amitabh Bachchan, the big B. Amitabh Bachchan, Amitab. yes. Yes, well done. The legendary sort of De Niro type hero of godfather of Indian cinema, really, who's still alive and still working very, very vociferously. So I think these people will always have their following. But I think the streamers are capturing an audience that Bollywood never could. And I asked Manoj, in fact, on this, why his character has so much appeal amongst Indians and others internationally. This is an every person's life story of walking the thin rope to create a balance between a demanding family and a demanding job. We've always seen spies doing extraordinary jobs, doing some great stunts and getting into the enemy's camp and all the impossible stuff. And we always looked at them in awe. But here, this spy is an ordinary guy doing an extraordinary job. And this is what everyone goes through from India to England. You know, all the people are going through the same kind of conflict, same kind of a struggle as your protagonist is going through. So it is relatable and it is entertaining. There's another story, Rani, that I heard about last week, and this is a story from Bangladesh about the tiger killer who has been on the run for some time. He's been apprehended now. That's right. He lives near to this amazing mangrove forest in Bangladesh. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's called the Sundarbans, and I've been there, Dot, and if you can imagine driving through a vast forest of lush, luscious trees of all types and the sunlight glinting through the leaves and amazing kind of waterways, and it really is a, a wonderful place, and it houses the world's largest population of tigers, which the World Wildlife Fund has noted have made a remarkable comeback in recent years from dropping in numbers. They're unique amongst the big cats because they can live and hunt in the brackish water of the mangrove forests and they can swim too. The Bengal tiger doton is a sacred animal in Bangladesh and in India actually. It's the national animal and its symbol can be found on all sorts of products. And there are only a few thousand tigers remaining in the whole world because illegal traders have been hunting them for pelts, for bones, and even flesh. And this guy, his nickname is Tiger Habib, he'd been hunted for 20 years, and three previous arrest warrants had been put out for him. 
but he was caught last week, as you say, and arrested. So people are very, uh, especially nature lovers, are very, very pleased about that. Indeed, he apparently has been responsible for the, you know, pretty much decimation of tigers in in that region. Why, why was he killing tigers? What was in it for him? The more the more they're classified as untouchable animals, the obviously the the illegal market becomes more expensive for them, and the pelts, the bones, and the flesh are what people will pay for. You know, you can always find someone somewhere in the world that's prepared to pay for contraband, so to speak. And he killed no less than 70 tigers. The locals feared him and respected him a little bit too because he used to go into the Sundarbans forests and he used to fight the tigers and kill them. So there was obviously a great deal in it for him. But the locals, are they supportive of the tiger conservation or not? Yes, they are. By and large, everybody is. And the Bangladeshi government and the nature lovers, those whose job it is to protect the wildlife of the forest, are really, really passionate. I've met them. I've worked with these guys and these ladies, and they really care a lot about every single bit of wildlife and the animals and the birds and everything that's that exists in these forests. How, how do they live side by side with the tigers? How, how do they given that the tigers are very much, they're dangerous. Well, forest rangers, they have their own buildings and they know where to go and, and what to do. And I think, you know, if it came to meeting a tiger, they'd find a way of handling it that doesn't do it harm. They're very, very experienced. They undergo years of training they're the kind of guys who will just get really excited if they find a new brand of mushroom, for instance. And they care. They really adore these animals and they really care about preserving them. They take it as their duty. And of course, as it's a sacred animal and the national animal of Bangladesh and they're fiercely patriotic, they become quite fused with preserving them.